good afternoon everyone uh, welcome to this session which uh, has generated i think a lot of uh, interest and keenness mm -hmm. so we are uh, projecting this live on our floor so people who are based in head office can maybe just huddle around and uh, there are school teams who are joining in we are also recording this session so a copy uh, a recorded link will also be available uh, later on uh, but before we begin, I think uh, first a uh, huge thanks to Bhuvan for taking this time out. Uh, and for those who don't know Bhuvan, uh, uh, Bhuvan has been somebody who has been, uh, you know, associated with Lighthouse uh, for some time while his stint at uh, KKR. But now, of course, he's the chief business officer at uh, Ultra Human for the last 14 months. But before that, like I said, while he was with KKR, he was uh, Lighthouse was obviously one of the uh, uh, portfolio companies that he was uh, working very, very closely with. He was on the board as well. So uh, uh, very warm welcome, uh, Bhuvan, and great to see you in a completely different avatar this time around. And, uh, you know, this session, like I said, uh, there is a bit of inquisitiveness around this because uh, not everybody... Uh, is aware about uh, what uh, uh, you're going to talk about, you know, yeah. uh, the, the session uh, title doesn't uh, fully do justice to it. So over to you, Bhuvan, for this. Well, thank you so much, Rohit. Um, so I, what I'm going to do is I'm just going to project some slides and 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 get, uh, you know, start the session. Hmm. So obviously, you know, this is session one, we, we're going to talk about biohacking. Um, you know, I have to put this disclaimer. <laughs> so please speak with your doctor before trying any interventions. Generally, a good idea in any case. Um, but you know, most of the stuff we're going to talk about is only lifestyle. So it, it's we're not going to talk about any medication or anything like that. So most of this is low risk. But generally, we we don't know your backgrounds. We're not speaking one on one. So please do check with your doctor. Um, your syllabus, right? So what what does the next few weeks look like? Um, we are going to talk about uh, biohacking today. It's going to be a little bit sort of all encompassing. We're going to talk about many different elements. And then there will be specific, more targeted sessions on nutrition, um, on running, and then uh, health for all. So that's that's really what we're going to be covering in the next few weeks. Um, my quick background, uh, Rohit talked about it a little bit. Um, you know, I, I used to be a biomedical engineer and an R&D scientist many years ago, almost 20 years ago, uh, and then switched to uh, private equity and finance. Um, for 10 years. Uh, and most recently, I'm a you know biohacker and an and entrepreneur. So um, like I said, I, either I'm a lifelong student or I'm a career counselor's nightmare. But I think, um, you know, it's basically folks like yourselves who set me up to be able to make all these changes and, and make all these moves uh, over time. Um, and I think that's really sort of testament to uh, the ed education system. So you know, it's it's a privilege and an honor to be here uh, and talk to you about this stuff. So all this is fine, but like Rohit said, you know, um, I've been a big fan of uh, Lighthouse Learning for a long time. Uh, I've known Prajod since 2018, I think, so four or five years, um, and was involved in the uh, KKR investment in 2019. So uh, this was one of the early workshops that, that we did, and I'm sure many more were uh, done after this, but uh, I know a lot of the team members, not all of them, but a lot of the team members. So again, it's a privilege to be here uh, and talking to you about this stuff. A uh, quick introduction before we get into the content. What is Ultra Human? Why am I here? Um, so I joined Ultra Human about, you know, about 14 months back. Uh, the problem that we're trying to solve is metabolic disorders. So um, this is something that everybody's aware of. So I'm not going to spend too much time. Um, there are a lot of diabetics, as you know, there's a lot of pre-diabetics, a lot of obesity, uh, lots and lots of different issues uh, that we're trying to solve. But broadly, you could think of it as chronic disorders, lifestyle disorders, they're all somewhat the same thing, right? So think of it as all of those things. I'm not here to talk about um, things that require surgery and so on. I'm, I'm here to talk about lifestyle uh, disorders, uh, which are which are a huge problem in the world today. Um, how do we tackle it? We tackle it through wearables. So we have a glucose monitor. That, that helps us figure out your food. We have a, a ring that helps us figure out your workout, sleep, stress, all of that stuff. And together we talk, we try to figure out what your lifestyle is and give you the right advice. 
Um, this stuff is just for background. Just wanted to cover this. We have some idea of why I'm here and talk, talking to you. I live and breathe this stuff um, all day long. Um, my background 20 years ago was in continuous glucose monitors. So I was in, sitting in the R&D lab making these things. So I have a good amount of familiarity with this stuff. Okay, now on to the main topic, which is what is biohacking? So before we get started, do a post on the chat. If you have any questions, we'll try to tackle them. The idea is to cover um, a few topics and then go to Q&A uh, in about 15, 20 minutes. So we've, we have about 20 minutes for Q&A. Uh, so, so do post on, on, on the chat. All right. So we're going to start with a bunch of myths or facts, right? So um, do post what you think, uh, whether this is true or not true. Um, this one, okay. Now, you know, we have Complan, we have uh, Horlicks, we have Ovaltine. I don't want to pick on any one of them, but the, the, you know, these are all beverages that are um, marketed towards kids, marketed towards um, good growth, uh, healthy growth, all of that kind of stuff. So I think this is the first one that I want to, you know, ask you guys. I'm sure we see ads for this all the time. Do we think that, you know, and we know protein is good, right? Protein helps you grow muscle and all of that. So do we think that these are full of protein or, um, or not? I think somebody raised their hand. I'm actually not sure how to, how to answer that. Uh, answer that. Is there a Q&A? Uh, this is to all the participants. You can uh, look at the chat box or the Q&A box and maybe answer this, uh, any you know, questions or... So for example, if you want to raise your hand and answer this, best way is to type in the chat box or the Q&A box, maybe. Yeah, so we have some answers coming in. Um, you know, lots, <laughs> clearly are very well-educated people. Uh, they're saying it's a myth. It's, it is not full of protein. Um, yeah, so again, not to pick on Horlicks or any one of these guys. This is the first one that popped up on Amazon. If you look at 100 grams, 79 grams are um, carbohydrates and a lot of it is sugar. So, uh, and 11 grams of protein. So that's that's not very much. Um, so for the calories here, I think at 377, 377 calories, you're getting 11 grams of protein. Um, for comparison, you know, whey protein, which is commonly available, about 100 grams for about 20 to 25 grams of protein. So. Uh, quarter the quarter the calories and twice the protein, right? So, um, so that's that's what we're looking at. This, you know, is important because we need to learn how to read labels. Uh, we need to understand what is going into our body, and the best way is not the front of the box; it's the back of the box. Ideally, it should not even be a box, but you know, we are we are uh, we are all tied up for time. So, uh, do learn to read the back of the box. Just you know, think, just see whether it's protein, carbohydrates, fat. Those two, three things itself will make a big difference, right? So the next one we talk about is all extreme cold exposure is bad for you. So, you know, for example, when I was a kid, my dad would say, oh, you just came out of the bath. Uh, don't go in the AC room. Um, my grandmother would say, you're going to get a cold if, you know, in De Delhi summers, go in and out of the AC room, you're going to get get a cold, um, you know, and, and things like that. Would you guys know, is all cold exposure bad for you? I think we have a few more coming in. Um, again, folks are saying no. Some, I think most folks are not, maybe haven't, don't have much experience with this. Um, but let's go on to the next slide. Actually, there's this budding form of um, therapy called cryotherapy. So, you know, we've, we've heard of different types of therapy, um, but there's a new thing called cryotherapy. In this, what happened is, and, and again, this has to be done in a very, very controlled environment. So please, there's one of those things, you know, when they say, please don't try this at home, this is definitely one of those things. Um, so what they do is they blast cold air, um, minus 100 to minus 140 degrees Celsius uh, onto your body. And in fact, in many cases, the uppermost layer of your skin actually freezes a little bit. And the, this causes, um, you know, responses in your circulatory system, muscular tissue and nervous system. Uh, the idea really is to help with recovery. So when you have cold um, exposure, uh, a lot of the blood rushes towards the skin. Uh, you also, which causes uh, better recovery over time. So that's that's sort of the principle. 
this has been used um, uh, you know by by many athletes so athletes would use this for uh, like you know for example take a take an ice bath for example you don't need to do this in cryotherapy but take an ice bath for example um, and that's uh, known to be helpful for recovery again you have to use this carefully because if you're trying to grow your muscles doing this immediately after a um, strength training workout is not a good idea so everything has to be done you know with with the right set of um, uh, you know instructors i would say uh, somebody's talking about ben greenfield uh, vinaya yes ben greenfield does talk about this uh, looks like a very well-educated uh, bunch of people in the audience. So thank you for that. Um, next one, having small meals throughout the day is better for metabolism. So, you know, I don't know if you guys have heard, but bodybuilders used to eat, or maybe they still do eat meals every two or three hours um, when they're trying to put on uh, put on muscle. Uh, they'll wake up in the middle of the night and and eat and so on. So that's that's usually the the um, you know what people refer to anybody has any idea whether this is good for you or bad for you or, or more specifically good for your metabolism so nikhat says good and and you know we'll define metabolism uh, soon but it's worth just getting your views anybody else many small meals throughout the day versus larger meals People say good, not Dr. Anita Madan says not good. Hi, Anita, how are you? Long time. Okay. Um, somebody says intermittent is better, but they prefer to remain anonymous. Let's go to the let's go to the next. Let's get into what this is about, right? So what happens is that every time you have a meal, so we'll we'll keep it uh, confined to carbohydrates for now. But when you have a meal, your uh, blood glucose goes up, right? Food goes into your mouth, goes into your tummy. It goes and starts going into your blood and your small intestine. Blood glucose starts going up. In response, your pancreas says, oh, blood, blood glucose is going up. I have to do something about it um, and start secreting insulin. And this happens every single time you eat. Um, the levels of insulin differ. So for fat, there will be hardly any insulin. For protein, there'll be a little bit of insulin. And for carbs, there'll be the most amount of insulin. And if there is simple carbs, so, you know, extreme case, if you take glucon D, um, there's just going to be a lot of insulin because there's a lot of glucose that goes directly into your blood. So the insulin secretion is, you know, somewhat proportional to the rate of glucose uh, increase. So that's what your body is trying to control. So glucose goes up, insulin goes up, and then eventually insulin causes the glucose to come down. So, so that's how it works. Now, what we found is the more times you have this cycle. Every time you go up, come down, go up, come down, go up, come down, um, that's actually can lead over time to various kinds of uh, diseases, If uh, especially depending on what you're eating. So for some people, um, there is a benefit to having intermittent fasting. What does intermittent fasting mean? It just means you have maybe two meals a day or you restrict the hours of the day that, during which you eat, which means that your glucose is not going up and down and your insulin is also not going up and down. Uh, and that can be helpful for uh, for many folks. So this is uh, another example of something that, you know, again, has to be individualized, uh, but there is no straight answer to this. A um, couple more. Glucose spikes, again, on the glucose topic, glucose, glucose spikes are normal and harmless um, reactions to sugar. What do folks think about this? Not always. For some people, yeah, yeah, it's it's you know it's. Um, I think the teachers will appreciate this. This was a bit of a trick question. Uh, <laughs> so a spike, um, actually, it it depends on the the amplitude of the spike, right? So how high did it, did it spike and and so on. So your your body actually, if you look at you know um, your your glucose values, uh, they're changing all 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 the time. So you know it could be between 70, 80, 90. This is milligrams per deciliter, but the unit doesn't. Um, uh, it's not that important. But your glucose is changing all the time. Why is that happening? It's happening because every cell in your body uses glucose. So your brain, for example, can is using a lot of glucose. Chess players can use two thousand calories 
um, during a match. If it's a very, very intense match, you know, it's almost like a supercomputer that's been switched on and it's just hungry and, and, and uses up glucose. Uh, your muscles use glucose. So when you go for a walk, your muscles will end up using glucose. Your liver can take, take in glucose, convert it into glycogen. Same thing, your muscles can take in glucose and convert it into glycogen. So all the time your body is making adjustments uh, to keep your glucose within a particular range. So in most cases, glucose will go up and down a little bit. So the example here is somebody did strength training. What does that mean? You're activating your muscles. Muscles are taking glucose out of the blood. The, the glucose went down. Then you had a milkshake, uh, depending on whether it had ice cream in it or not, your, you know, your glucose can go up. Um, now, what happens is if this goes up and down a lot, right? And we talked about why going up and down is a bad thing. If it goes up and down a lot, it ends up starting to do damage um, to your blood vessels, to your body. Uh, and then you end up with cellular damage in your body. And uh, you can have things like Alzheimer's. You can have insulin-linked cancers. You can have hypertension. There is a whole host of, there's like a, a syndrome called metabolic syndrome, uh, which is the result of um, some of these issues over time. So the answer to this question is, yes, glucose is moving around all the time, um, you know, as you go through your day, but having too many spikes over time can actually cause, uh, cause issues. Let's see if there are any questions. Yep, not yet. Um, the other one is metabolism can't be changed, right? So we often hear, oh, that person is thin. He's got a great metabolism. He can eat whatever he wants. Um, or somebody else, you know, no matter what he does, he will never lose weight. Um, what, do you guys, what do you guys think of that? Nikat says can be changed. It's a myth. She still says it's true. When I says it can be influenced. Um, so what's the answer? Again, it's a little bit of a trick question. We all have a certain metabolism. We start with that. That's a combination of many, many things. It could be your genetics. It could be your microbiome, um, uh, you know, and things like that. But, you know, we think that that is less than 10%. So 90% is still uh, in your own hands, right? Let's talk about that. We talked about insulin a little bit earlier. So let's introduce this concept of insulin resistance. Uh, what does insulin resistance mean? It means that your body's ability to take up glucose in the blood gets impaired. So uh, over time, let's say you're, uh, you know, um, for example, if you're a diabetic, you could be insulin resistant, which means that you and I, if I'm not a diabetic and you're a diabetic, we eat the same thing. We have a vada pao. Um, your glucose will go up much higher than mine. The reason for that is your body is unable to take up the glucose out of your blood. When glucose is high, like we talked about, your insulin will also be high. High levels of insulin over time will end up with, a, you know, you'll end up with weight gain. Um, you'll end up with other issues. We talked about those other issues. It could be Alzheimer's, it could be cancer, it could be other things. So that is what we talk about when we say insulin resistance. The causes of this could be, you know, if you're on a high sugar, high calorie diet, uh, if you're overweight, if you have a sedentary lifestyle. So I'll explain all of these things. So for example, high sugar, high calorie diet, what is it doing? It's causing spikes in your blood glucose over time. When you have a spike in your blood glucose, you get a spike in your insulin, and over time, your body becomes resistant to insulin. So, you know, when people talk about oh, antibiotic resistance, things like that, that's a little bit similar to what is happening here. Obesity. So when, um, when you're overweight, it's actually harder for your body to uh, take, up that, uh, take up the glucose. Sedentary lifestyle means that your body, uh, your muscles are not able to take up uh, the insulin because they're not in use. Uh, when you're active, your muscles actually take up uh, glucose and your insulin comes down. Uh, stress is an interesting one. So we often get questions like, oh, I was in uh, traffic the other day and my glucose spiked. Um, and is that normal? Am I normal, right? Uh, the reality is that it's a, if you guys remember in biology, there was the flight or fight kind of um, reaction. So when you're, when you're stressed, your body releases various hormones. One of them is cortisol. Cortisol causes glucose to be released into your blood. And that's because your body is getting ready for um, action. Now, if your body is getting ready for action, but there is no action, 
you know that is chronic stress you're just constantly stressed but there is no action so there is no use for that glucose and over time that causes issues um and then there are a bunch of other things that cause insulin resistance i think what we want to obviously focus on is the opposite which is how do you cause insulin sensitivity so think of insulin sensitivity as um you know the opposite of insulin resistance meaning your body is extremely good at being able to control glucose and therefore insulin um which means that you will find it easier to lose weight um you will find it you will find yourself being more productive you will find yourself having more energy how how do you get to that right everybody wants that how do you get to that so one is obviously you know to have a better diet so we talk about high fiber high protein complex carbs <clears throat> non processed foods why do we do that is because most of these don't dump glucose into your blood so when your glucose is is going up slowly your body has a chance to control it through insulin over time uh weight loss is very important so it's it's interesting because you know when you lose weight it's good for you uh but when you follow these practices you will also end up losing weight so it's sort of a bidirectional uh, outcome here uh but if you lose weight uh that generally makes you a lot more insulin sensitive you will find it easier and easier over time to absorb the glucose that you have uh active lifestyle two elements to this one is taking walks so when you take a walk your muscle actively takes up the glucose uh and strength training which means that your muscle is ready um to take up glucose when there is um you know glucose in the blood so that's that's pretty important i know there's a lot of concerns around strength training that you know maybe i'll hurt myself uh, i don't like to lift weights all of that stuff it can start very simply a lot of body weight exercises um things like that but there is something that you ge- uh, genuinely need to consider especially longer term so typically after the age of 40 um you will lose 10% of strength um every single decade of your life uh and there's nothing you can do about it other than actually exercise uh, and make sure you're strength training so the only thing you can do is actually just maintain your muscle mass um which is why this is really really important uh stress reduction we talked about that um that i think uh we'll let rohit rajiv prajod handle uh that's not something i can do for you um and then better sleep sleep is extremely important um like one of our advisors says there's no system in your body that works better with less sleep like literally every system works better with uh um, more sleep better sleep and we'll we'll talk about that a little bit okay now we're getting into a bit more controversial ones all ghar ka khana is healthy what do what do folks think do you do you think if that if that were the case then we would be facing all these metabolic crises do you think we'll have all these cardiac issues and <laughs> health issues so i think this is a key part of you know our philosophy which is nothing is good by itself nothing is bad by itself right i mean it it has to be looked at in your whole lifestyle so the way i think about it is you know your khana has to match your lifestyle right we eat more than our grandparents and we move less so um my grandparents definitely did you know back in the day definitely didn't have a car uh, or they had to share a car um they ate a lot less than than we did they had a lot uh, you know forget even the quality of the food i think the quantity of the food was also dramatically less um it's so easy to access food now uh, you know you, with swiggy and 100 rupee biryanis and stuff like that so i think um as you think about your lifestyle there's you know there's i think we are actually very very lucky we do get ghar ka khana which means that food generally is less processed fresher than than many other countries uh, but you do have to keep an eye on the macros um and you do have to which means how much carbs how much protein how much fiber and so on and you do have to keep an eye on more importantly uh, on the amount that you're eating as well um uh, this is by the way not helped by the fact that our um concept of hospitality is aggressive feeding so you know just have to be careful about that um next one is natural sugars are good for you so again um probably something that my grandmother told me um but you know unfortunately it's it's really not it, it's not true when when you're eating good it's still like 95% sugar um the danger is it tastes less sweet so i end up putting more good than i would put put sugar because i have feel less guilt also 
Um, but by and large, you're pretty much consuming the same thing. You have a few trace elements, um, but you know, guys, just be careful about this kind of stuff. Again, important to understand what you're putting in your body. Um, now we're getting toward the end. Glucose monitoring is only for diabetics. Any thoughts about that? Myth, no. Uh, Neelam is asking, will you share this PPT with us? Yes, I think the PPT will be shared with you and uh, the recording will also be shared with you. So people are saying glucose monitoring is for everyone um, for weight loss and diet control, it should help. Yes, it helps actually. There is There are no wear, wearables for food. So how do you figure out what you're eating is, you know, how is that impacting your body? This is one way to do that. Um, the other part that's this is important for is for prevention, right? So one fact I learned a couple of days ago, um, which I, you know, which was shocking, is 45% of diabetics visiting eye clinics in India had already lost their vision before the condition was diagnosed. So suddenly they've lost their vision. They don't know that they're diabetic. And the reality is that, that studies show that, for example, if you lose 5% of your body weight or 10% of your body weight, you can reduce your chance of getting diabetes by 60%. So, you know, if you lose, let's say three, four kilos and you can reduce the chances of getting diabetes and preventing blindness, preventing neuropathy, you know, continuing to eat most of the foods that you want, uh, you know, that's a, that's a really good outcome because once you are in that position, unfortunately, your options are limited. It can still, you can still do a lot, but by that time, it's, it's much harder to do. So um, we really think prevention is better than cure, uh, whether it's glu you know, glucose monitoring or any other way. Um, do focus on that. Okay, last one. This one is, if anybody's on social media, you will be bombarded by people saying, you know, do high intensity workouts, jump up and down. I burned 400 calories in 20 minutes, um, all of that kind of stuff. What do you guys think? Are these the right activities for burning fat? Just remember, your body has many fuels at its disposal, right? Your body can use glucose, your body can, which is by the way, the fastest. Your body's body can use glycogen, which is a form of kind of like a form of glucose, which is stored in your liver and your muscles, which is second fastest. Um, your body can use amino acids, which is what your muscles are made of. Uh, and lastly, your body can use fat, which is actually the slowest. Um, you, you cannot liberate fat in a very quick way. So in fact, the, what happens is that um, zone two, and I'll explain what that is, it's moderate intensity. That is where fat is actually being burnt. If you get into higher than that, if you are indeed doing jumping jacks, if you're doing sprints, if you're running marathons at a fast pace, uh, you're most probably not burning as much fat as you could be burning. Your body has probably switched to some other form of fuel. Let me explain this. Um, these are various zones um, in terms of heart rate. So think of it as a heart rate zone of zone one being you just, you know, take a simple walk, um, zone two being slightly higher than that. So I'll use some examples, but these you should, um, uh, you, we, there are formulas to figure out where your uh, zones are. So zone one could be 100, 110, you're taking a walk, you know, pretty slow paced. Um, zone two is slightly faster pace, could be 110, 120. Um, you're starting to burn fat here. Um, zone three is, you know, what they talk about, like, for example, if you're jogging with a friend and you're able to um, uh, speak with them. So that is one, one test of that. Uh, but it shouldn't be over, let's say, 140, 150. All of this still here, you're still able to... Uh, you know, use aerobic, um, you know, what they call aerobic respiration. So you're mostly burning fat, you're starting to get into more glucose, more glycogen. Once you start getting into zone four and five, that's sort of your maximum effort. So, you know, heart rate is probably 160, 170. You're out of breath. You can't sustain a conversation. You're going pretty fast. Um, that's most, uh, that's where most high intensity workouts are. So what we say is for most people, you know, start with a walk. So if you can, if if you're able to walk, um, start with a walk. If you're at 
1,000 steps a day, get to 2,000 steps a day. If you're at 3,000 steps a day, go to 4,000 steps a day. We are really sort of big proponents of spending, um, you know, in, incremental effort, right? Because the the bigger the change that you're trying to make, the less chance that you'll actually be able to stick with it. So um, it's very, very important that you make small changes uh, over time. Uh, Sheetal's asking a question. So when I go for a walk, um, I try to walk at the fastest pace possible. Is that good? Uh, yeah, I think that's fine because when, you, when you're walking, um, in most cases, it's very difficult to exceed, let's say, 130 uh, heart rate or so. Um, but you know what we can do is as a follow-up, we can share uh, various formulas. And if you have a fitness tracker, you can actually figure out uh, what zone you're in. But in general, uh, the you know walking, especially if you're able to talk and you're not getting uh, out of breath, uh, you're probably fine. Okay, now <laughs> with half an hour through and we'll finally get to what is biohacking. Um, so you guys would have heard a lot about, okay, biohacking is this, biohacking is that, right? What what is what exactly is biohacking? Um, so the way we look at it is, you know, it's do-it-yourself biology to enhance physical and mental health and extend lifespan. So it actually has many, many different components to it. Like people, you know, different, uh, there are different sort of, you could say trends or different things that are part of biohacking. I will focus on a few of them. Uh, but the, the most important part of all of this is that you are taking um, ownership of your own health. Your health is not being outsourced to somebody else, right? You are saying, I want to be better. I think I can do better. What else should I be trying? Um, that's the key importance uh, factor. Um, not, you know, not outsourcing it to your parents, not outsourcing it to your gym trainer, not outsourcing it to your doctor. Um, so this is uh, fairly important. Um, I'll cover a few. We talked about intermittent fasting a little bit. This is sort of, I would say, more basic. Um, you build it up. You, you Maybe some folks can start with skipping breakfast. And over time, if you're feeling okay, you can build up intermittent fasting. Um, lots of detailed work around this. Happy to share more details over time, but this is a fairly basic one. Um, CGMs, continuous glucose monitors. That's We talked about that a little bit. Um, those are helpful when you're trying to do all of this. So again, a CGM is not going to run on the treadmill for you, right? This is more of a diagnostic to help you understand how are you doing? How are various foods impacting your body as an example? Um, so a CGM is very, very helpful because the, it clears up a lot of the confusion. When I walk, my glucose goes down. When I run, my glucose goes up. Um, so some things are not uh, intuitive. Some things are, um, have to be figured out with data. Black coffee can make your glucose spike. Uh, stress can make your glucose spike. Um, so stuff like that. So a CGM is really, really helpful to, to figure that out. Um, there's another thing called quantified self. So other than your glucose, you sort of um, you know track everything. So I'm tracking how I'm sleeping, how many steps I'm taking, how many people I'm talking to, uh, all of that stuff. So, so that's called the quantified self movement. Um, and then one example of the advanced one uh, and I think some of the biology teachers would be aware of this one, uh, is CRISPR. So CRISPR is a new technology, relatively new, less than 10 years old, um, which is for modifying your DNA. So, you know, when you say, oh, you know, I was born with it, you know, th those days are going to be gone pretty soon because literally you will be able to inject yourself. Um, okay, maybe not yourself. Maybe you should do it with a doctor you'll be able to actually modify your DNA over time. So if you were born with certain genetic conditions and so on, you will actually be able to change those over time. So that's obviously an advanced um, version of, of biohacking. Most of the time, we, we tend to spend time on sort of the left side and the middle. Uh, and to be honest, those by themselves uh, are, are fairly powerful. Um, I think we have a couple of questions. Let me just address this before we go on. Uh, Janvi says, is walking on the treadmill harmful in the long run? Um, I don't think it's harmful per se. Um, I think what folks say is just, you know, if, if you're able to be outside, uh, it just provides a bit more, um, it's a bit harder, like, you know, you in terms of your balance uh, and things like that. So um, generally variety is a, is, is a good answer. Uh, if, if, of course, it's not, that's not possible, then um, do, being on the treadmill is better than not doing anything at all. Um, Satwant had a question, would the lactate zone lead to muscle cramps? 
Uh, yes and no. So what elite athletes do is they actually build up their capacity to um, withstand lactate over time. Uh, lactate not doesn't just cramp, it actually hurts. Um, so it, there's a physical sensation of pain. Uh, and there was an Italian cyclist, I'm forgetting his name, who was just had a higher pain threshold. He just trained himself to push through, push through the lactate. So, you know, um, it's, it's, it's not, uh, it's not doing any physical damage to your body, but it's, it's generally a sign that you're pushing yourself pr pretty hard. Um, let's go on to the next page. So a couple of dense pages, and then we'll, we'll get to some, some tips, right? So what does, what does it uh, include? So once one is science backed intervention. So what is happening is that there is a big gap. So for example, if, a, if somebody discovers something in a lab, um, and I used to work in a lab uh, at Johns Hopkins, there's a big gap between that and something coming into the clinic. Um, so what biohackers are looking for is, hey, is there a new scientific discovery that maybe we can use in, on a, in a DIY way uh, before it comes you know, to the clinic and before doctors learn about it and, and so on? Um, again, this could be something like intermittent fasting, which has not yet become uh, a clinical protocol, uh, but has been shown to uh, um, have a lot of benefits to many people. Uh, and again, what we want to do is, you know, in this session, we want to stress uh, on very, um, uh, what can I say? Uh, these are low risk interventions. So if you don't eat breakfast for most people, uh, you know, you can do without that for a couple of days. That's not really going to hurt you. Uh, if it works for you, then continue with it. If it doesn't work for you, then, then obviously try something else. But um, what we want to stress in this session is low risk uh, interventions for biohacking. The second one is personalized, personalized data and feedback. Why is this important? Because otherwise, how do you know what is working? Right. So if you if you're trying something, how do you know what heart rate zone you're in? How do you know how your body is reacting to your food? Uh, so this kind of stuff is is really, really important. And I think we're actually kind of living in the golden age of this stuff. Um, the Fitbit 10 years ago just told you how many steps you walked. Um, now that itself is helpful, but today your watch, um, you know, the our, our, we have a ring, the ultra even ring, a Fitbit, uh, there's a tracker called Whoop. Uh, it's amazing what all of these things can do, uh, you know, sitting on your wrist. Uh, again, goal-based progress tracking. So that's the next one. Um, typically, there's an outcome that you're trying to get to. So, um, and, you know, that's the difference, what people call difference between exercise and training. Um, you're actually trying to push towards a particular goal. And that's where all the personalized data, feedback, all of that sort of stuff helps. Um, we'll skip the last one in the interest of time and quickly get to some tips. Let me just check on, on the Q&A. Uh, how many steps to walk daily to lose weight? So again, I'll give you, it's a trick question. I think it, I'll give a trick answer. It's just more than you're walking today. <laughs> yeah. So so, the, so look, the, the reality is if somebody says walk 10,000 steps, but you're walking 9,000, that's, I mean, there's going to be marginal impact to that. But if you're, if you're at 1,000, then trying to do 10,000 is probably not a good idea tomorrow. So I think what you really need to do is increase the number of steps, whatever you're working today. And, you know, I have sort of huge empathy for teachers. Obviously you're on your feet the whole day. So you know, somebody is coming in and saying, walk more steps. Um, that can be painful. But generally, whatever your level of activity is, you know, walking a little bit more, uh, lower intensity, zone two uh, can be helpful. So I think... 10,000 steps is a, is a good um, benchmark because 10,000 steps typically means about seven kilometers. That's quite long. Uh, some teachers might be covering that in a day. I'm not sure. But um, even if you're not at 10,000, if you're starting at 2,000, try to get to 3,000, try to get to 4,000. Your body is actually capable. Most people's bodies are capable of walk, walking at least 10,000, if not 20,000 steps a day. So, you know, if folks have traveled to, you know, other countries on a vacation and stuff like that, you know, you go from 3,000 steps a day to 20,000 steps a day. And, you know, maybe you have a little bit of ache and pain, but generally you're quite happy and you're, you're perfectly fine. So um, in most cases, if you do it in low intensity, um, your body is capable of a lot. The high intensity stuff. So for example, if you start running immediately, you will definitely have aches and pains. You might tear something, et cetera, et cetera. But walking in most cases is, is perfectly fine. Uh, there's a question, what would be the best way to reduce weight with PCOD syndrome? syndrome should we start with walk or high strength training 
it gets very hard to re reduce weight even after walking. Yeah. So this one, uh, to be honest, I would consult uh, a doctor because it depends on the um, the uh, you know exactly where you are. So so PCOD, PCOS, fairly broad spectrum uh, in terms of whether you're at you know how how severe it could be. Um, I, I completely agree with you that you know just walking by itself is is difficult. So you might need to have a combination of a nutrition intervention uh, plus walking uh, plus even medication depending on on you know how severe it is. Um, Kavita had a question: Is having tea empty stomach in the morning and not having breakfast bad for health? Um, it's something that you have to be careful with. So there was a there was, a, there was some time where I would have like a really strong, like a, like a kadak chai, and then I'd feel really pukey uh, if I don't, didn't eat anything. Uh, but I found, and it, same thing with black coffee. Um, but I found that uh, if I would drink like, you know, a cappuccino, then that's perfectly fine. No, no impact. If I drank too many cappuccinos, then I would end up with getting acidity. So, um, you know, take it easy, go slow. So if you're, so for example, if you're having, um, Tea, have have a little bit of it, see how you feel. Uh, if you are having a bigger breakfast, reduce the size of your breakfast. If you have breakfast at 8 a.m., try to push it to 9 a.m., see how you feel. I think the idea of this is to continuously be extremely uh, incremental in your approach and see how you're feeling and, and go from there. And that's where some of these trackers and all that are really uh, kind of helpful uh, because, you know, over a long period of time, they'll help you understand, okay, am I really walking? People say, oh, yeah, yeah, I walk 10,000 steps a day. If you go and look at your Fitbit, it'll tell you the truth, whether it's really happening or not happening. If you're doing food logging, it'll tell you whether you're actually eating at seven or not. Um, if you're, and whether you've, you know, for example, been uh, eating donuts or, or or things like that. So I think just be incremental, Kavita. Try, um, you know, try tea. If it's not working, um, you know, try something else. Uh, have a lighter breakfast and then and then sort of go from there. Um, so we're going to go through some tips quickly. Um, so sleep. Now I I would we're going to go through sort of beginner, advanced, and pro tips uh, in three four categories. I would say make sure you don't jump to pro. Always start with beginner because that's where you will get the most uh, bang for your buck. If you're already doing that, please of course feel free to proceed. So sleep. I think the first one is use some kind of a wearable, right? I mean, you, you can use whatever you wish, um, but use some kind of wearable to figure out. Most people think this, they're getting seven, eight hours of sleep a day. Most people are not getting seven, eight hours of sleep a day. Uh, especially, they might think that's time in bed, but usually you go to bed, you know, you put on some social media, you put on some YouTube, um, you might be answering emails from your boss. You're usually not getting that level of sleep. Once you start tracking how much you're sleeping, then you can start to pay attention to what is the quality of your sleep. Are you getting enough REM sleep? Are you getting enough deep sleep? These are different zones of sleep which are helpful for recovery. So one is helpful for forming memories over time. So how do you, uh, so, you know, I'm, I'm sure my, most biology teachers would know this. During the course of the day, your, your memories are all, and your data is all being stored in, you know, like, you know, back in the day we had RAM, right? So it's like um, temporary memory. And then at night, it sort of gets downloaded into something a bit more permanent. So if you're not getting good sleep, you're going to have trouble with, with that kind of stuff. Um, so first thing is just use a wearable, understand what different types of sleep means. Next one is advanced. So now you start doing uh, different types of experiments. So there are many people who have told me that, hey, I've stopped uh, drinking alcohol because every time I drink alcohol and I look at my wearable, uh, it shows that my sleep has been terrible that night. And therefore, the next day is, uh, is, is bad. Third one, then you can start getting into other things like controlling your environment. So controlling your room temperature, right? For some people, colder is better. For some people, warmer is better. So um, of course, please do check with your uh, wife or partner or spouse before you start doing all of these things. But that's why I put it in advance because you know you will get a lot of bang for your buck by doing even the beginner or the advanced. Um, pieces. Um, let's go on to food. First thing to do, you know, most people have this post-lunch um, coma situation. So you have your lunch at one o'clock, 1.30. By three o'clock, you're yawning. Um, you're saying, okay, let me go get a coffee uh, and things like that. I'm sure many of you are feeling this right now. Um, but 
try one thing, try to reduce the, the portion of carbs, increase the fiber and increase the protein and see how you feel, right? And keep a track of that. Um, for a lot of people, that is pretty helpful. The reason for that is when you eat carbs, like we talked about, your glucose goes up and your insulin goes up. That feels great. When things are going up, it feels great. But then when it starts going down, that's when you start feeling lethargic. And usually that takes, let's say an hour, hour and a half after you've eaten. So if you reduce the carbs, uh, you will reduce this sort of yo-yoing that, that happens after your lunch. Um, second one is, you know, of course you can be, try, wear a CGM to be even more precise, understand what impact the, the meals are having. So we had a diabetic, for example, who said, hey, I use this to figure out, I, I, he, he loved idlis, okay? He's a South Indian, he loved idlis. He said, I can't do without it. Doctors told me not to eat it. So he said, I figured it out that I can eat two, but I can't eat four. Normally I eat four, but now I can eat two and, and my glucose is just fine. So this is getting more precise. You know, what can you eat? Sometimes the combinations uh, are important. So for example, if you really want to eat, um, uh, you know, roti and rice and stuff like that, sometimes you can eat um, salad before that. Sometimes you can eat protein before that. And the order of your meal also makes a difference. Uh, the timing of your meal also makes a difference. So all of these things become much easier once when you're tracking it with a, with a CGM. Uh, pro, of course, intermittent fasting. Um, <clears throat> that's why with Kavita as well, I said, you know, do everything uh, incrementally. So for me, what I did was I started with um, skipping breakfast. <clears throat> I was still having coffee because I really needed it. Um, but I knew because of my CGM, it wasn't causing a glucose spike. So I think that was fine. Um, and over time, I built up to about 22 hours. So it was 22, 23 hours, which was basically one meal a day. So I would basically have one meal around seven o'clock in the evening. Um, it was more to try it, try it out. I, I know, you know, I'm the type of person I end up with this. I don't know if you heard of it, hangry, right? So when you're hungry, hungry, you become angry. So usually I'm that type of person. I need to eat when I, when I need to eat, I need really need to eat. So, um, but I found that you know, if I built up, built up to it, uh, actually I could, I could transition to one meal a day. And, and a lot of people say there are a lot of benefits to it. I didn't continue with it. It was for me more of an experiment, uh, but that's something that you can, you can deal with. Um, that's the advanced part and the pro we talked about as well. We'll quickly cover activity and, and stress. Um, activity, we talked about it, find some time uh, in your daily routine. So one is a post-dinner walk. Uh, look, this is something that everybody can do. Right, you're at home. You've had your dinner. Go for a five-minute walk. Go for a ten-minute walk. Um, obviously, this is getting you back on your feet. But very importantly, what it's doing is helping your muscles absorb all the glucose in your blood. So the timing of the walk is also pretty important. Um, advanced level, start putting in some strength training. So this is, you know, get a maybe perhaps get a trainer. You can do a lot of basic stuff, right? I mean, if if you um, and, and there are three, four exercises that you can do that, that will cover a, a large part of your body. And once you learn them, you'll, you'll, you'll realize they're fairly simple. Um, these, this has huge benefits uh, to how you'll feel. Um, and uh, you know, also reducing muscle loss over time. Uh, last one is obviously getting to the pro stuff. So marathon, CrossFit, um, weightlifting, Olympic weightlifting and all of that. Uh, stay away from that in most cases, unless you have built up through beginner and advanced. Okay, last one, stress. Um, so this might seem like a repeat, but add activity to improve your hormones. What they found is that actually physical activity is fairly important in your um, how you feel in your mood uh, and also mental health over time. So I was listening to some podcasts and it basically said that, you know, Sudoku and mind games and all that stuff is, you know, maybe could be helpful, it's unclear. But if you're um, physically active, uh, that is actually the biggest uh, predictor of whether you'll be able to, you know, how, how mentally sharp you'll be later on in life. So get some activity, it doesn't matter where you start, but uh, start somewhere, right? Um, so that's important. Uh, advanced obviously is uh, start maintaining a gratitude journal. So this is, um, this advanced and the pro, you, you know, there are many ways to, to tackle this. So um, there could be journaling, there could be uh, meditation over time, there could be mindfulness. Uh, I think everybody is going to get um, free access to our app for a month. So there are various, various exercises there that you can um, uh, 
uh, try out you know there are we have collaborated with a lot of folks in UCLA and a lot of um, uh, in, you know scientists to to figure that out so maybe one easy way to do is just download the app ultra human app and and try out uh, a minute two minutes five minutes uh, and see if that is helpful um few questions let me answer try to answer them uh, rashida says but they say breakfast is important and not to skip your breakfast uh I'm not sure who says this. Uh, I know it's been said. I will not deny that. Um, again, I, I would encourage you to try it. Um, not, you know, there's not going to be a huge issue if you try it once. So, you know, of course, if you need need energy, um, so I'll give you I'll give you an example. Like right? uh, ragi, jawar, all these are millets. All these are really great sources of energy. When we were active, when we were farming, when we were on the road all the time, probably a great breakfast to have, right? And then get on the road and then expend all that energy. Uh, these days, if I'm going to have, and I, uh, you know, I'm purposely going to be uh, facetious here, but if I'm going to have puri aloo for breakfast, I'm not going to be burning it off. For me, at least, I'm going to go sit on my um, sit at my chair. Uh, so it's, I didn't find a big difference. Uh, for not eating breakfast, um, but I would say try it for yourself, and it also depends on your lifestyle. Again, if the teachers on the call, they're going to eat breakfast, and then they're going to be on their feet for six hours. You know, that's a di that's a different uh, use case than than for me because typically I'm either seated or I'm you know at a standing desk. Uh, but I think the answer really is to try it out for yourself. Uh, somebody else asked, "What time is good to have dinner?" Um, generally, they say maybe two hours before you go to sleep. Uh, the reason for that is that it, it it helps in a couple of ways. So one is it gives you enough time to do your post post dinner uh, walk. The other is what you want is a lot of the gastric emptying to happen um, by the time you're starting to fall asleep. So they say that if your stomach is a little bit emptier by the time you sleep, um, your sleep will be better as well. So that that's typically what they talk about. We do have some folks who figure out with the with the glucose monitor that. Um, their overnight glucose is going low. And when that's the case, we advise them to have dinner later. Uh, but in general, you know, two hours before sleep should be should be good. Uh, Sudha said, if we're doing one hour, daily one hour of yoga, is it okay not to do other things apart from our daily routine? I think if you're doing one hour of yoga every day, congratulations. Um, you're probably in the 1% of uh, active folks. Um, yoga is very good because your muscles will continue to stay strong. It is something that you can do, you know, probably uh, into your 80s or 90s, if you if you continue with that uh, practice, um, the only addition I would say is maybe get in some zone zone two exercise every once in a while. Uh, that's going to help essentially your metabolism also be uh, healthier. Um, and we can we can get into mitochondria and all of that stuff, but um, that's the science behind it that your mitochondria are actually healthier uh, when when you're getting zone two exercise. Uh, Rashida, how is jogging on the spot comparable to a brisk walk? Um, typically, jogging on the spot will end up with a higher heart rate, so you will probably get out of zone two. You might get into zone three or four, uh, but it depends on on the pace. Um, so the ideal way to do this is just to get um, you know one of the wearables that tell you what your heart rate is, um, and 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 just to figure that out. Uh, Satwan says, what shall be the uh, period of win uh, window for dinner time to sleep time to reduce acid reflux. Uh, if you have acid reflux, uh, again, please do speak with your doctor. Um, you could try incrementally moving your dinner earlier or later by 15, 20 minutes at a time to see what is helping. Um, my understanding of acid reflux, and I'm definitely not a doctor, is that what you eat is as important as when you eat it. So perhaps you might have to experiment with both of those things, but do, do speak with your uh, doctor. Uh, Anita, you're asking about zone two. I'll, I'll, I will flash back to this. Um, this is what I was talking about, zone two, which is a moderate intensity. So, uh, you know, brisk walking uh, for as an example, or, or slow jogging could be an example as well of zone two. Okay, perfect. Stress. Um, one, one last thing. Please only try to make one new habit at a time. Um, making new habits is very, very difficult. If if anybody has tried this, they will realize that most habits are, you know, you you will, most habits that you try 
to form intentionally, you will be unsuccessful at this. So it's very important to start with one at a time, get feedback, um, you know, hold yourself accountable, keep a journal, ask somebody to, to keep asking you, hey, have you, have you worked out? Uh, have you done this? Have you done that? Get a wearable. So the more things that can keep you accountable, the more likely you, you'll be able to form this habit over time. But please just start with one. We covered a lot of tips, but do start with one. Um, Shruti had a question. Is it really necessary to eat within 20 to 30 minutes after a run? I run early mornings. I practice intermittent fasting and I skip breakfast. Yeah, I mean, you know, we have a lot of people who are um, what they call fat adapted. So they actually uh, sounds like you've been doing this for a long time. As long as you're not seeing sort of, um, as long as you feel fine after it, um, really there's there's no issue. Um, so I, I I wouldn't worry about that. Okay, now a couple couple things. If you want, to, if you're interested in more stuff, we'll obviously have three more uh, seminars. Check out our blog if you're interested. Um, we'll also circulate a if um, a link uh, that you can click on to give us uh, your callback details in in case it would be helpful to speak with somebody live. And now we can we've had a pretty good Q and A session, but in case folks have any more questions, um, you know we have a couple minutes. I'm happy to address those. Uh, by the way, the form is on the chat, so you could um, just click on it and and you know if if you'd like, give us your email, give us your um, phone number, and we can call you back. Does intermittent fasting? Anubha's question is: Does intermittent fasting help? in a uh, fat burn. So, so hi, Onuba, good to hear from you. Um, uh, so yeah, so I, let me, let me address this in two ways. So one is that what people find is that if you do intermittent fasting and if you're successful, you tend to be less hungry during the course of the day. So you will typically people's calories will also end up going down. Um, so that is obviously helpful in maintaining a caloric deficit. Uh, do make sure that you are getting enough protein um, in that case. Uh, because that's, that, otherwise you'll start losing muscle mass. So that is that is number one. So it could help that way. Secondly, it, it could help because it keeps your insulin levels low. When insulin is low, your body will use fat for uh, for its fueling. So that's why I said if you do low intensity exercises, um, then your insulin stays low and your body will use fat. Uh, if you're doing intermittent fasting, your insulin levels will be low and that your body will be sort of incentivized in some sense to use uh, fat. If you reduce your uh, carb intake and you increase protein intake, same, same thing will happen. Your insulin levels will remain lower. So those are some of the ways in which uh, intermittent fasting could help uh, in fat, fat burning. Um, I have seen some videos of people online who say, oh, you know, I'm, I'm eating one meal a day so I can eat whatever I want. And then they'll eat like you know, pastry and donuts and 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 processed food. Um, that obviously, please don't do that. That's not helpful at all. Um, how much water intake should we have per day? Uh, I think, I, I mean, generally, most people are not drinking enough water. I carry a, around a water bottle, so I hit at least two to three liters a day. Um, that tends to be enough for most people. Um, my doctor told me once um, that as long as in the middle of your day, your urine is clear, that means it's it's not even light yellow, but it's completely uh, clear and white in color. Uh, that's a good sign that you're getting enough water. Of course, it's not going to be that when you wake up, but if in the middle of the day, if you're drinking enough water, it should be like that. Um, how good is it to take proteins with a high uric acid problem? Uh, that one, please talk to your doctor because again, um, this is something that uh, the doctor will have to balance out for you, potentially along with medication. Um, Prajod, yes, uh, are we getting some cool devices? Yes, we do have um, specials for you guys. So we do have discounts and stuff like that. And um, you will get uh, details for that uh, in the email right uh, after the session. So later today. So do check it out. Um, and then, you know, even if you just want more information, uh, you could click on the link and just give us your 
uh, details and we'll call you back. Great, so it's four o'clock, Rohit, uh, should, we, should we wrap up? Uh, yes, Bhuvan, so actually Rohit had to uh, get into another meeting. Oh, no problem. no problem. So uh, thank you, everyone. I hope there are no more questions. And if there are, uh, I request everyone to click on the link in the chat. And Ajay uh, Human will actually give us a phone call. Uh, to help us find out and also help us with their device, the app. Uh, uh, and we'll uh, surely share the recording and we are hoping to get the PPT as well from you to sure. share with the audience. Thank you. Absolutely. Thank you. So All right. Thank you, guys. And uh, look forward to the next three sessions as well. Thank you. Bye.